And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tricia. That was beautiful. Happy Sabbath, church family. You know, I'm grateful that Jesus is coming again. It was uh, interesting. This morning I got a text from my parents that my grandmother's oxygen levels are dropping. And she'll probably pass away today or tomorrow. And then we got a text that a very good friend of my wife and I has gone into labor and is about to have a child. And you realize we live in a very difficult world. But there is a day coming when there will only be life and no more death. And I want to go home. And I know you do as well. And yes, we have some time between now and then. But it's this probationary period of time that God has given us where we have the privilege to take the gospel to the world and hasten the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And to share with the people of the greater Lansing area the good news that we have, the understanding of Daniel and Revelation and the critical pieces for this time in earth's history, God has given us that it is not something for us to hold to ourselves, but for us to share, what do you say? Because there are neighbors that God wants you to have in heaven. And we have the privilege of being a part of that. So I know and I trust that you're praying for Crossroad, America at Crossroads, which is coming up here in about a month. We have our opening night, and it'll be right here in, in this sanctuary. I know that you are keeping that in prayer. I know and I'm thankful for those of you who have stepped forward and said, hey, I want to be a part of this. I want to be able to make a difference in my community because I believe that God is going to move in a mighty way through this series. How about you? Praise the Lord. He's coming soon. Would you bow your heads with me as we ask God to be with us as we begin? Father in heaven, we are so grateful that in the moments when life is coming to its close, we can trust in Jesus. And in those moments when a new life is beginning, we can trust in Jesus. And that whatever may happen in between those two events, as we trust in Jesus, everything will work out. A few moments, we're going to open your word. Oh, Heavenly Father, we need your Holy Spirit here in this sanctuary. We need you to guide and move on each heart, one of our hearts and our minds. And so we ask that you will banish Satan and his angels from having access to this sanctuary. We ask that, Holy Spirit, you will speak individually to each one of us and that we will leave transformed by the power of your Spirit. Hide me behind the cross is our prayer. And speak through my lips in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. For three and a half years, the prophet Elijah has watched the landscape wilt without any water. I don't know if you've ever visited a place that's very dry and and, or is a desert. If you've been out to some of the places in the um, Arizona or Utah or some of those places where there's very little rain, it's very dry. And I can imagine in my mind's eye, Elijah, as those years are coming to an end, he's out walking and all he sees is parched destruction and desolation around him. The dust is swirling because when you don't have rain, you get lots of dust. Trees are withered, the leaves are gone, places that have been known as almost Edenic in their beauty. All that's left is the parched wilderness. 
As Elijah has watched these three and a half years go by, you've got to put yourself in his shoes. We say three and a half years like it's not that long ago, but that would have been a year and a half before COVID hit us. And we know how long this last two years have felt, right? Am I the only one that's felt like it's been a long time? No, I know you all have too. And, and as he's been watching this, and as he's been praying, we talked two weeks ago about how he was praying earnestly, and God, in answer to, to Elijah's prayer, said, Elijah, this is what I'm going to do to bring my people back. I'm going to take three and a half years of no rain so that they will realize that these gods that they think are going to provide what they need will give them nothing, that all their sustenance comes from me. Now, we might look at that and say, well, you know, thank the Lord. I don't worship pagan idols. I know that my sustenance comes from God. Amen. We know Jesus provides everything we need. What do you say? But I think sometimes we, we might be able to relate. If standing for truth costs you your job, do you really believe God is your ultimate provider? If standing for what the Bible teaches on the Sabbath, or standing for what the Bible teaches in any one of these different profound foundational doctrines that we have, and God says, this is what I'm calling you to do, and there's a clear, thus saith the Lord from the word of God, and everything's on the line, do you really believe that Jesus is the one who takes care of you? Now, it might be easy to say, yes, I know that, I believe that. But, but, but let's say that you stand for the right and you lose your job. And six months go by and you're in a drought of no money. Do you still trust God? Let's say a year goes by, a year and a half, two years. Maybe three years go by. Do you still trust In the hand of the Divine Father who leads all according to His omnipotent plan. As the three and a half years went by, there was this amazing uh, quote I came across in a book called Prophets and Kings, page 133. It's a historical sketch of that time period, and, and the author here pens these words, and I thought they were profound. Through the long years of drought and famine, Elijah prayed earnestly that the hearts of Israel might be turned from idolatry to allegiance to who? God. So as the three and a half years are going on, Elijah's not twiddling his thumbs. He's not saying, you get that, you guys are worshiping idols, look what God's doing now. No, he's on his knees because he has the heart of God. He cares about the people that are under punishment. And he's saying, Lord, turn them from paganism to Jesus. When we're in trials, guess where we need to be? On our knees. When we see a friend of ours in trials, guess where we should be, church? On our knees. Now notice what he says, what what the author, what, um, what it says here. Notice this continues on. Patiently the prophet waited while the hand of the Lord rested heavily on the stricken land. As he saw evidences of suffering... And want multiplying on every side. His heart was wrung with sorrow. And he longed for power to bring about a reformation. Guess the next word. Quickly. Did Elijah want the three and a half years to take all three and a half years? Yes or no? No. He wanted to end it. He hated to see people going without food and without water. He hated to see the suffering that was there. But God was doing what he knew was best to turn his people from their brokenness to a relationship with him. And church, I can assure you, however long it takes, God will do because he loves you enough to take you through what's necessary to save you. What do you say? Not so easy to say amen when things are going well. It's a whole other thing to say amen when it's going rough. Ending the paragraph here, but God himself was working out his plan and all that his servant could do. This is Elijah the prophet we're talking about. Don't miss this point. All that his servant could do was to pray.
on in faith and await for the time of decided action. Waiting is hard. The first point of my sermon today, of our study together, is give God time to work. I don't like to wait. I don't think I'm the only one. If there is ever an opportunity for me to shortcut the process on something, I was generally, as a child growing up, the one who figured out how to make it get here quicker than slower. In fact, when I was young, um, before the Lord converted me on this, I got, not proud of it, pulled over quite a few times because I was trying to get quickly from one destination to another. I don't like to wait. But there are times when my haste has brought more problems into God's church, into God's, my personal walk with God, than waiting for God to move. There are times when we see things that are happening around us and we're like, wait, how can God let this take place? Why isn't God moving on, on his individuals in different positions to speak to this? And, and, and we get frustrated that, that it seems like this is just holding on and on, but, but God in his infinite wisdom is working out what he sees best. And as Elijah is watching this and he's saying, I don't understand, God, please, would you let me do this? He was wise enough to know to wait And let God do what he needed, knew needed to happen. He gave God the space to work. Hold your finger here in 1 Kings. We're going to be reading in a moment from 1 Kings. But hold your finger here in 1 Kings. And I want you to go forward with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms verse, uh, Psalm the 27th division in the 14th verse. Psalm 27 and verse 14. And when you're there, if you would say amen. Let's actually start in verse 13. This is a a beautiful psalm. David starts off, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You can read the rest of it later. But we're coming down to verse 13. Are you there, church? Psalm 27 and verse 13. I would have lost what? Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. David here, who had to wait quite a while for God to work out his omnipotent will in his life, says that he would have lost heart, but he chose to believe in the goodness of who? God, in the waiting time, is doing two things. One, he's working out what needs to be done in the situation around us, but he's also working out something in my life, that that faith and that trust that everything I need, God will provide in his time. I would have lost heart, the psalmist says, unless I had, what's that word, church? Believe. Say it with me. Believe. Keep reading aloud. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of who? The living. Now notice what he says in verse 14. Read it aloud. Wait on the Lord. Wait on who? The Lord. Don't try to rush God's process. Don't try to short circuit. Don't get involved in trying to pressure individuals in different directions. Wait on who, church? Elijah walked in with a message to Ahab. He said, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next three and a half years and accept it my word. And he walked out. He didn't tell Ahab why. He walked out and he went and he went by a brook. He was fed by the miraculous working of God. God took care of him. He then went to a widow in Jericho. Pastor Jericho talked about that last week. And he waited, and he waited for three and a half years. Do you think it was easy to wait and say nothing while God moved? But what was God doing? God working his omnipotent will. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. I want you to see this continue on. Now, if you're looking for Isaiah, it's right there in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. For those who are pulling up the slides upstairs, I'm going to start in verse 29, and you can follow along in your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 29. We're moving down to verse 31. Isaiah 
He, the creator of the ends of the earth. Are you there? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. Notice what it says. I heard a couple of yeses. I hear some pages turning. Let me know when you're there, church. All right. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. He, God, gives power to the who? The weak. And to those who have no might, he increases what? You say, Pastor, I don't have the strength to wait. God will give you the strength. And the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. Now verse 31, read it aloud with me. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Keep reading. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you wait on God, He shall renew your strength. You know, a lot of times I think we try to do these things in our own strength. We run ahead of God. We're like, okay, God, you want me to do this? Great. Let me go do it. We don't wait for God to say, move now. We get ahead of it, and we're now doing it at our own strength. And now it's no longer God moving, but it's Phil's works trying to move in God's behalf. And can Phil do anything good? No. Who alone is good? God. Now, God working through me, he can do great things. God working through you can change the course of history. And God working through you will change the course of history. But you and I going out ahead of God and doing our own thing and trying to force situations to move, we will not move God's work forward. We will only hurt ourselves and hurt the work of God. We must have the wisdom to know and wait for God's timing to be perfect. Some stories in history that I think of. Think of Luther, who stood before the Diet of Worms and is called to retract. And he stands there and he says, I cannot, nor will I retract, unless I am shown from Scripture that I am wrong. And he put himself under the authority of Scripture, what do you say? This wasn't an arrogant movement of, you can't tell me what to do, because that is not the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is surrender to the Word of God. But after he took that stand, his life was in jeopardy and God moved him and hid him away in the Wartburg Castle for several years while Jesus did his work in the city, in the country of Germany. And it was hard for Luther because he heard more and more things are being stirred up. And then finally, at the right time, God released Luther from where he was. He wasn't in prison, but God sent him from there back in and the Reformation did a mighty work. While Luther was waiting, he translated the Bible. The most powerful thing he ever did was give the German people the Bible in their own language. He didn't twiddle his thumbs while he waited. He was anxiously moving on the things that he could while he let God work. Hmm. There's several other stories in history. I don't have time to tell many of them, but there's one other that I came across. This Battle of Bunker Hill, you guys remember that story, American history, Battle of Bunker Hill? During the American uh, revolution, revolution, freedom from England, General Putman, Putman was there, and, and, and the English were coming to attack, and they were greatly outnumbered. The Americans versus the English. The English had far better troops, they were far better trained, they had lots of equipment, they had plenty of ammunition. General Putman looks at what's coming and he realizes he is greatly outnumbered. He has low gunpowder supplies. He comes to his men and he gives them this rallying cry. And he says, gentlemen, you are great sharpshooters. You can hit a, a, uh, a um, squirrel from 100 yards. I know you can take out the enemy, but you must wait until you see the whites of their eyes. And then when you shoot, make every shot count. Do not let any one of them miss. And so the men waited, and according to the historical accounts, there were some that were struggling to wait, but they held off until the English were close enough that they were able to then shoot. And though the English won that day, it actually, in a good way, changed the course of history because they lost 1,054 people, and the Americans only lost 450. They waited until the right time. And from that point forward, the British were quite concerned, and it actually changed how they interacted, and some have made the case that what happened at Bunker Hill was another critical step in the process of the British realizing that this was a war they could never win. Waiting 
for the right time. One last verse, Psalms 37, 7 through 9. Psalms 37, verses 7 through 9. I like how David pens it here. By the way, not all the psalms are written by David, but if you go look at the beginning of this psalm, you'll know who wrote that psalm, and this one was one of those by David. Notice what it says, verse 7. Are you there, church? Rest in who? Don't rest or fret about your ability to get what God wants done, done. Don't worry about what God's going to do. Rest in the Lord and, what's that next word there? Wait. Now, it doesn't just say wait, because you all know how we can wait, and it's not patient. You're sitting at a stoplight, and you're desperately trying to get somewhere, and the person in front of you is just taking forever, And you're going like, come on, come on, won't you just, come My wife is a much more patient person than I am. (laughs) But don't just wait and fret. Wait what? Patiently. Do you think Elijah was there in the room? And the widow had to keep saying, Elijah, it's okay, you can calm down. Do you think he was pacing back and forth? Or do you think he was trusting in the God who was going to take care of it? Elijah was trusting. Now, I'm sure he had moments of wishing, and and there were moments where he was tempted to fret. But he rested in the Lord. Keep reading with me. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because of the man who brings a wicked scheme to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be what? But those who wait on the Lord, they shall what? Inherit the earth. I want to inherit the earth. How about you? So we must wait. So point number one is get God's space to work. We must quickly walk through the other two points here. They will be much more rapid. The second point is faith, trust, obedience, and calmness. And point number three is going to, God will vindicate himself. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 1, or 1 Kings chapter 18, as we look at the last final pieces of our sermon this morning. 18 and verse 1. After the waiting came the command to go. And though God may call us to wait, and when he calls us to wait, church, we must what? When then God calls us to go, don't decide you're now going to chicken out and wait some more. Because when God finally ends our time of waiting, He says, now's the time to move. That is our call as a church to move forward. That is our call as individuals, as families. Whatever your situation may be, that is the time to move. Notice here, 1 Kings chapter 18, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying... Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. God called Elijah to go. And Elijah heads over, he presents himself to Ahab. You know that you can read the rest of the story in your own time. It's fascinating. He shows up, and he he actually does it through a messenger. He meets Obadiah, who is a faithful follower of God in in in, in Ahab's court. And he says to Obadiah, he says, hey, I I want you to send a message to Ahab that I want to meet with him. And he's like, whoa, 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 why are you doing that? I've been a faithful follower of God. He was afraid that Elijah would disappear. He doesn't. God, Elijah assures him, I won't disappear. I'll be here as sure as the Lord lives. And Ahab shows back up. And Elijah, after three and a half years, God has finally brought it to the point where Elijah can speak to the issue. Notice what he says. 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to go far forward to verse 
17. Picture the scene in your mind. Here comes Ahab in his royal robes. He's got his armed soldiers around him, his personal guards. They're walking up to meet a prophet, standing alone with no guards that human eyes can see. But when we wait on God and then we go at God's command, we are guarded by the most powerful beings in the universe, the angels of heaven. And though Ahab could not see, Elijah was surrounded by a retinue more powerful and more glorious than any kingly mo human earthly monarch has ever had. So what does he say? Verse 17, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And, they, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel. Verse 18, But you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. When we go at God's command, we go with the authority of the king of the universe. It's interesting to me, who's the monarch here? Is Elijah the monarch? Ahab is the king. Who should be in the way that we would normally look at it, giving the authorities, the prophet or, or the king? You would think the king should be telling the prophet, do this or that. But Elijah comes in representing the king of the universe. And there's an authority that goes with those whom God sends that everyone will recognize at some level. And Ahab recognizes the authority. And, and though he didn't like it, he now answers the command of God. And he calls all the prophets of Baal. And they make their way to the Mount of Carmel. And all of Israel gathers. The king becomes the servant of the prophet and gathers everyone for the showdown of the century. As everyone gathers on that fateful day, picture the scene in your mind. There's the mountain. People from all over Israel are streaming in. For several days they've been arriving for this momentous showdown between who are the true gods. 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah show up. 450 and 400, respectively. The king arrives at the head of the... That's a lot of priests, by the way. Pagan priests. The king arrives at the head of this entourage of pagan priests. There's tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of the Israelites gathered around watching what's happening. And one lone prophet of God wearing camel's clothing is there representing the king of the universe. What a showdown that must have been. Elijah was able to stand fast because he had waited for God's command. Now as he stands there at the top of the mountain, his faith is brought to the forefront because he is trusting, he's obedient, and he's calm in the promises of God. As I look at the time, I realize I don't have time for the next two points. So with your permission, we're going to end our sermon here with an appeal and a story. And we'll pick up with Mount Carmel in two weeks. Can you say amen? Give God space to work. I don't know what you're facing in your life. I don't know what challenges you have gone through this last week. But I believe that there is someone here today or watching on the live stream. That you are in the middle of a situation right now. Where you are facing challenges and difficulties. Maybe people around you know about it. Maybe no one else does. And you're being tempted or you're struggling with the desire to step in and fix the problem. I want to appeal to you. 
Give God space to work. Go to your knees. Surrender your pride. Surrender your desires for self-exaltation. Tell the Lord that you're willing to do whatever He asks. That this isn't about you, this is about His honor and His glory. And then wait until you know God has told you to move. You say, well, pastor, how will I know? Did God make you? Church, did God make you? Did he create the way that your mind operates? Do you think the God who knows how many hairs you have on your head also knows how to communicate with you in a way that you'll understand? Is God want to have you make a wrong mistake? That should be an easy one. No. God wants you to do right. Amen? And so church, if you go to your knees and you ask God to guide and you surrender your pride, you surrender your desires, your plans, and you say, Lord, it's here for you. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. I can assure you on the promises of God that the king of the universe will show you in a way that you can understand exactly what he wants you to do. What does James 1 verse 5 promise? If any lacks wisdom, let him ask of who? Who gives to all liberally and upbraideth not. King of the universe will give you the wisdom you need. Now there's a three-step process. I'll just mention this. You can ask me for more details later. If you want to know God's will on any decision you're making, the first thing you ask is, does the Bible command it or forbid it? The second thing you ask is, what counsel does God's word have about this? If, it doesn't, if the Bible doesn't command it or forbid it, then you ask the question, what counsel does God's word have on it? And then third, and lastly, you ask, what indications of providence does God have, and what counsel do I have from godly people in my life? If God commands it, you stop right there and you do it. If God forbids it, you stop right there and you don't do it. But if he neither commands it nor forbids it, then you ask, what counsel does he have? And you wait on your knees until God makes it clear what he wants you to do. Church, how many of you will say, Lord... By your grace, I will wait and move only in step with you. You want to make that commitment? Let's pray. Father in heaven, you've seen our hands. You know our desires. We want to be in step with you. You know our tendency to run ahead of you, our tendency to be behind you, our tendency to think that we're fighting for you when we're only fighting for ourselves and our own selfish desires. Oh, dear Jesus, please forgive us. Teach us how to be humble, to be gracious, to be teachable, to be loving, and how to be in step with you, waiting and moving at your command. Bless everyone here. You've seen our decisions. Help us to now live this. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our, as the song leaders come forward and lead us in our closing hymn, hymn number 341, To God Be the Glory. Please stand. To God be the glory.
with me. Father in heaven, I ask that you will send your spirit upon each one of us. We pray that you will continue to teach us how to be in step with you at every moment. To give us wisdom, guidance, understanding, and direction. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here. May the grace of Christ hold us, constrain us, and guide us. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you're visiting today, we want you to know that the first time you may be visiting, but the second time your family, and that we're glad you joined us today. May you know God's love. Reminder for those who would like and are brave, there is ice skating at our house tonight at 6. May God bless you. Happy Sabbath. We'll look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, next week. Mm-hmm.